Now this evening we're looking at Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 and um, I am, I'm not sure exactly where I asked you to begin the reading but would it be possible to, to begin in verse 6 of, okay is that where we're starting anyway? Okay. <laughs> All right, well, I'd like to read verses 6 through uh, verse 21 of Romans chapter 5. And again, it uh, reminds us of the great grace of God in sending His Son for us while we were yet ungodly. And we're going to seek to understand why it is uh, we are ungodly. We understand that we exist because God created us. There is just no way that we could be unless an infinitely intelligent and powerful designer had created us. Evolution uh, doesn't explain anything, and it isn't even possible. But the reason why we're in the moral condition that we're in is because of what the first man God created did, and that's what we want to focus on this evening. So beginning in verse 6, Paul writes this. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression, for if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one. Jesus Christ. Uh, focus on these last verses because I realize Paul can be kind of hard to understand. So then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now again, Paul says a lot of things in here. We're not going to look at all of it. Obviously, we wouldn't have time to unravel everything he says here. But the thing I do want you to notice is that we are in the situation that we are in because of the one choice that Adam made when he was in the garden. That is what brought us into the predicament that we're in. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this evening. Now, remember, we considered this morning that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you trust him, if you turn from your sins, you are not judged, you are no longer condemned because Jesus obeyed for you, because he paid the price for your sins upon the cross. But we also saw if you don't believe, you're condemned already, not because you don't believe, though certainly that's the only way you can be saved. And if you are presented with the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel 
and you reject Jesus Christ, that will increase your condemnation. That isn't the reason why you're under condemnation. You're under condemnation because of your sins, because of your sinfulness or the disposition of your heart against God. Now this evening, I want us to look at or to remind ourselves why it is we are in that condition when we come into the world. And it's because of one decision that one man made many years ago. And that is, of course, the decision Adam made to disobey God in the garden. Now, I'd like for us this evening really to look at two things that are very simple. But as we unravel it, we'll see there's quite a bit to each of these. I want us to look at two things, that Adam is the one who made you guilty. And Adam is the one who made you corrupt. When you think about consequences for decisions, now here are some very significant consequences. Adam's sin brought guilt and corruption and condemnation upon all of his children. And that's the reason why we are in the situation we're in today. As a matter of fact, everybody in the world are basically distant cousins. We're all related. We all come from these two parents. And we are all as we are. All the sin, all the evil that's in the world came from this one decision of Adam. So first of all, let's consider that Adam is the one who made you guilty. And certainly if we ask the question, well, who is this one man that Paul is speaking of here, through whom sin entered the world, that brought death to all men, that actually killed you, that brought death to you? Well, you know that it's Adam. He's the one that Paul is talking about in our passage in verse 14. He says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who have had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. By the way, it's, it's helpful for us to understand what Adam did to us so that we can understand how Jesus can do what he did for us. Adam did things to us, against us. Jesus Christ did things for us that are greatly to our advantage. Now, Adam is the one who first killed himself, who brought death to himself. Uh, God said in Genesis 2, verses 16 through 17, uh, the Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. That was the warning. And we know that Adam ate, and we know that Adam died. Adam is also the one who, when he killed himself, killed us as well. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 through 22, For since by a man came death, that's Adam, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all die will be made alive. And of course, again, in our passage in Romans 5, verses 17 through 18, for if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all all men. By the way, I, I, as I read those passages, I'm reminded that there are those who take these passages and say that Adam killed us all, but Jesus is going to make us all alive, and they teach universalism, the idea that everyone is ultimately going to be saved by Christ, but we're going to see that that is, in fact, not the case. Now, you, are, you do notice through these passages that Paul is continually making a connection between Adam and Jesus. He's contrasting Adam's disobedience with Jesus' obedience. And that's because these two men were both representatives. Adam represented everyone who was in him. And that is the whole human race. All of his children with the exception of one individual. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ who did not have a human father but a divine father. Jesus represented all of those who would be in him through faith in his name, all who would trust him by his grace. 
And that's what Paul means when he's saying that Adam was really a picture or a type of the one who was coming because as Adam represented his people, so Jesus would represent his people. Again, uh, verse 14 of Romans 5, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. The Bible says that, that Adam is really more than just our father. I mean, he is the father of everyone who is living today, even as Eve is the mother of all the living. He was also our representative. He was also, we, we call him in fancy terms, our federal head or our covenant head. He was the head of all mankind. When God put him in the garden, he put him there not just to tend the garden and to make sure that everything was, was you know, taken care of, cultivated, and to guard the garden, but he also put him in there to stand for us. He was our representative in what we call the covenant of works. I mean, the, the, the Lord calls it a covenant. We, we put a, another name to it. We call it the covenant of works because our well-being depended upon what Adam did with the particular trial or probation that he put him under. A covenant that we know, of course, that Adam uh, broke. Now, God calls this arrangement that God made or that he made with Adam a covenant in Hosea chapter 6 where the Lord is rebuking the northern kingdom of Ephraim or Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah for their sin. And I thought I would read a little bit of this passage and end it with the one that we want to look at just because I think it includes some good admonition for us in uh, Hosea 6 verses 4 through 7. Uh, the prophet, or actually the Lord speaking through the prophet says this, What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? That's the northern kingdom of Israel. What shall I do with you, O Judah? That's the southern kingdom. For your loyalty is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. Therefore I have hewn them in, in pieces by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth and the judgments on you are like the light that goes forth. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. There they have dealt treacherously against me. You notice that God's saying, you know what, your, your obedience, your loyalty is basically like uh, the dew which appears for a little while and then evaporates when the sun comes up. You are not steadfast. You are not faithful to me. He says, I delight in loyalty more than sacrifice. The knowledge of God, not that you would study you know, me and know me in, in the sense that you'll know facts about me, but this relationship with the Lord that you know him and he's your friend, you love him and you walk with him. That's, that's what he delights in. But even though he had made this covenant with Israel and with Judah to walk with him, they have broken that covenant just like Adam did when he was in the garden. He broke his covenant with God. Now a covenant is how God relates to us. It's, it's how he has a relationship with us. That's the only way that God ever has a relationship with, with anyone, at least outside of the, of the Trinity, is by way of covenant. A covenant is an agreement. Usually if it's, well, if it's between two men, it's an agreement they mutually make. But if it's, if it's an agreement between God and man, it's one he imposes upon us. And of course, we want God to do that because apart from doing that, we'd, we'd have no relationship with him at all. But in this agreement, God generally requires something of us. He promises a blessing if we will do that thing he requires of us. And he threatens a curse or a punishment if we don't do it. Now in the covenant of works which he made with Adam, he required Adam to obey him perfectly. He promised to give him eternal life if he obeyed him. And he threatened death if he disobeyed. Now, as I said, when he, when he placed Adam in this arrangement, he didn't do it just for Adam, but he basically had Adam stand for all of us. He put Adam on trial, but he was really putting the whole human race on trial at the same time to see if we would stand or fall. Now, you've got to realize that 
Adam, uh, at least theoretically, could have passed that trial. In a certain sense, it couldn't happen, but that was the promise, eternal life. If Adam had passed the trial, he would have gained life for us rather than death. All of us would have lived forever. We would know nothing about death. We would know nothing about disease. We would all live forever, first of all, beginning in this world, in God's presence, in a state of moral perfection. That is, we would have a perfect love for what is right. We would have a perfect love for one another. We would be living in a paradise on earth. There would be no war. There would be no hatred of one person for another that because there would be no sin. And there wouldn't be the complications of the curse, death being, of course, one of them, but dangerous weather, uh, earthquakes, tidal waves, famine, disease. None of that would exist. Just a perfect world of perfect love in the presence of God without any of these complications. And eventually, God would bring us all, once the earth was populated, once everyone was born that was going to be born, he would have brought us all into the eternal state where we would have enjoyed those blessings forever. Now that promise was actually held out to Adam uh, by means of a tree. You know, when he said, you know, if you, if you obey, you will continue to live, basically. If you disobey, you will die. Well, if Adam had obeyed, he'd continue to live. But yet, there was something in the garden that represented the, the end of the test, as it were, the end of the probation. When he had finally obeyed God, God would confirm him. And that particular symbol was called the tree of life, which Adam would have eaten from as a symbol of the life that he had gained for us if he had succeeded. And we can only, you know, we could only look back and say, I wish <laughs> that he had done so. In Genesis 2, 9, Moses writes this, Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I don't believe, and, and generally it's not believed, at least in our circles, that the tree itself could give life, but it represented the life that God promised to give Adam. And I realize that in Scripture it does appear almost as if, if Adam had somehow gotten to that tree and eaten it, he would have lived forever. I don't think that's the case. It's, it's kind of like in Scripture where sometimes it appears as though baptism is what saves you or that uh, when Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, that you, you won't have life in you, you need to somehow physically eat him. Those things can be misunderstood. Jesus is, is speaking representatively. You know, what baptism represents, what, you know, the Lord's Supper represents and what the tree of life represents. Not the re it's not the reality itself but it represents the reality and so sometimes in scripture is actually portrayed as though it is the reality but we know eternal life is only in God he has it to give and of course since the fall he can only give it through Jesus Christ so the tree of life was representative of that promise of what Adam would receive for himself and for all of us if he had only passed that test now the trial took place at another tree that is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now I think like the tree of life, there was really nothing special about that tree except that God singled it out and said, you can eat from any tree, but not this tree. This was a test of pure obedience. Whether Adam would listen to God, just his bare word, don't eat of this tree or not. In Genesis 2, 16 through 17, we read, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Now again, it's not because the tree had poisonous fruit. It's not because there was anything mystical about the fruit. It's because they would disobey God and fall away from God and become guilty and come under the curse of death. That is why you would die if you ate from that tree because you disobeyed God. Now, as I said before, the tree of life represented the end of the trial. If, if he passed the probation and didn't eat of that tree, he would receive eternal life. Does that mean that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would always be there and, and the potential to eat it would always be there? Well, no. God didn't intend for the trial to go on forever. That's why he decided to bring it to a head. He allowed Satan 
to enter into the garden and to tempt Adam to break the covenant. Now it's interesting how it is that Satan got into the garden because as a matter of fact, that's where he was originally. He was actually in the garden from the very beginning because that is where heaven was at that particular time in history. Basically, Satan, who at that time was called Lucifer, was on the holy mountain of God. And that mountain was in the middle of the garden and he was standing in God's presence. At the end of the creation week in which Lucifer and all the angels were also created, as God looks at all that he had made, he pronounces it good. Which means that at the end of the creation week, Lucifer was good, just like the rest of the creation and the rest of the angels. Uh, Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made, all that he had made. And angels are creatures, they are made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. But shortly after the end of that week, and I believe very shortly after the end of that week, uh, Satan fell. And we know that it wasn't very long after the end of the creation week because you know the fall took place before Eve conceived a child. It doesn't take very long to do that, especially when you're perfect and when you've received the blessing of God in order to be fruitful and multiply. That would have happened relatively quickly. But everything you see at the end of the creation week was good. Lucifer fell and tempted Adam and Eve before that took place, which means it happened very shortly after this week. In other words, Adam and Eve were really not in the garden for very long, not very long at all. But shortly after that, he fell. And he was thrown off the mountain. And since the mountain was in the middle of the garden, that's where he ended up. Now, how do we know all of this took place? It's because of what we read in Ezekiel, where God is speaking to the king of Tyre, and it's, but it's clear from what he says that he's really not speaking to the earthly king but rather he is speaking to that malignant spirit behind the king. In Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 17, I'm sure you've read this before. But the, God says to Ezekiel, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold. The workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. Now from what we read here, we see that Lucifer originally appears to have belonged to that special class of angels that are responsible for guarding the holiness of God, basically the cherubs or the cherubim. But we see that his beauty and his perfection, which apparently were greater than all the other angels, brought about his downfall. He became prideful and he rebelled against God. Elsewhere in scripture we see he sought to exalt his throne above that of God's which is incredible presumption. And so we see that God cast him off the mountain and he came into the garden and all of this was a part of God's plan. In his anger, Lucifer, who is now Satan, immediately set out to destroy those special creatures that God had made in his image, Adam and Eve and by destroying them, also their children. Basically, these creatures, uh, mankind, were those that God had created the angels to serve. They would be the ministers of salvation who would render service to those who inherit salvation. And it appears as though perhaps the knowledge that, that 
this was the reason why he was created. One who was so great, so beautiful, and so wise would have to serve such a creature that seemed so far below him. May have been the reason why he and the angels rebelled. And so Satan comes into the garden and he sets out to ruin mankind. Or more accurately, he tries to get God to do it by getting Adam and Eve to break the covenant. And you know what happened. He first came to the woman and tempted her. She disobeyed God. She ate of the tree and then she gave the fruit also to Adam who was with her. And he ate and he fell. Adam failed the test. And on that day, God executed his judgment upon Adam. Adam died. Now we know he didn't just drop dead. We do, but we do know that he began to age. We do know the seeds of physical death were sown in his body so that he eventually would die. We know something else happened to Adam on that day as well. The Spirit of God left him. And he knew that he was gone by the fact that he felt naked. He sensed, as it were, his moral nakedness. And he also came under the sentence of eternal death for having disobeyed God. And, of course, being our representative, those same things happened to us. We all died in him. Again, Paul writes in Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. All men sinned when Adam sinned. Now, we died when Adam died because of that very reason. When he sinned, we sinned. Because he was our representative, his disobedience was credited to our account. Again, verse 18 of Romans 5. So then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men because that crime was imputed to us. As soon as we were conceived in the womb, even as David told us in Psalm 51, that sin was imputed to us. Uh, we were brought forth in iniquity and sin, our mothers conceived us. That sin is the sin of Adam. And when that sin is imputed to us, God looks at us as though we ate of that tree because we did, in Adam, eat of that tree. Now basically, God put the whole human race on trial in that one man, Adam. And I know the temptation for us is to look back at that and criticize God for doing this. But let's not forget that God gave us a perfect representative. He gave us a perfect man to represent us. He didn't give to us an imperfect sinner. If we had been in the garden, we would have done precisely the same thing. If a perfect man couldn't resist this temptation, no one could resist it, at least no mere man. It was basically God's plan that Adam would fail and that we would all come under this judgment. Now, it's not that God made Adam sin, but he did know that despite his being perfect, that he would sin. Because God had a plan behind all of this. And his plan was to glorify his grace and his mercy through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, if Adam hadn't sinned and we had lived in that perfect world without any moral imperfection, with perfect love, with perfect you know, brotherhood among all men, with no sickness and disease and so forth, what would we know of God's mercy? We wouldn't know anything of it. What would we know of his grace if we hadn't fallen into sin? What would we know of, great, of God's great love for sinners in that he would send his son even to die for sinners? You see, God could not magnify the depths of his grace unless he allowed this to take place because he intended Adam to fall into sin and to plunge us all into judgment in order that he might send his son into the world as our redeemer, that he might glorify his grace and that he might honor his son. As a matter of fact, as we think about what we're going to be like in Jesus Christ versus what we would have been like if we hadn't fallen, okay, if we hadn't fallen, then still we'd be debtors to God's grace because God doesn't really have to give us anything. He doesn't even have to give us life. He doesn't have to give us continuance of life. Uh, so we'd see some of the goodness of God. We would get perhaps what Adam deserved when God fulfilled that promise to him, and that's it. 
That's what we would get in Adam if he had obeyed. But now we get what Jesus deserves for his obedience. And that's quite a bit more than what Adam deserves. So really, having fallen into sin and having been redeemed, in the end, we're actually going to end up better, better off than we would have if Adam never had sinned and we didn't need redemption. But again, why did God put us on trial in that one man at that one time? Well, the reason he did that was so that the outcome would be decided at once. I mean, can you imagine if this trial was going on for each individual, perfect people being born into the world, some of them falling, some of them not falling? That wasn't God's plan. God wanted the whole thing to be determined at one time in the same way that he determined it with the angels. Remember, all the angels, God doesn't continually crank out angels. He's not making angels as he needs angels. They were all created at one time. And they, since the time he has created them, they have all existed, the full number of them. Now, that's different than us because we don't all exist at the same time, but the angels do. And so God put them all on trial at the same time. And we know that, as we saw before, when Lucifer fell and became the devil, he took a certain number of angels with him. There were those who followed Lucifer, who followed Satan and rebelled against God. Those are those angels that we know in Scripture are called demons, the ones who fell. But we also know in Scripture that there is a group of angels called the chosen angels or the elect angels. Those are the ones who didn't fall, that God reserved for himself, the ones that, would yet, that he would yet send out to minister to those who would inherit salvation. They were all put on trial. God had his elect. He reserved those. He gave them grace to stand. There were those who were not the elect angels, and they fell away from God. Now again, we don't exist all at the same time in the way that the angels do. We are born at different times, and since the fall, we, we die, so we're not all going to be there at the same time. So we were all put on trial at the same time in Adam. And of course, we all became guilty in Adam at the same time, and we were all condemned by his sin at the same time. That was God's plan. And again, as we're going to see in the case of our Lord Jesus Christ, it was also his plan to justify those whom he would at the same time in Jesus Christ through these representatives. But now let's move on quickly to the second point. Adam's sin did more than make you guilty. It also made you corrupt, which is why we saw Jesus characterizing some, as he did in our passage this morning, as loving evil as loving the darkness and hating what is good. When Adam sinned, did it affect him? It, it did. It not only made him guilty, it corrupted him. Remember what I said earlier that when he sinned, he, he felt naked, didn't he? It's because he lost the Holy Spirit. He lost the sense of innocence and he realized that now he was guilty before God. He lost his desire for God and for holiness and that felt like something had been removed from him, something like a covering, the absence of which made him feel naked. Do you ever wonder why it is when you read the scriptures, it's like they eat of the tree and their eyes were open, they realized they were naked. It's like, hey, that's kind of like a no-brainer, isn't it? Were they so ignorant and blind that they couldn't tell they weren't wearing clothes? No, that's not what God is referring to, is it? That's not what Adam lost, and that's not what he felt. What he lost was his original righteousness. He lost moral holiness. He lost the purity the Spirit of God gives you, and so he felt naked. Now that loss also brought about a new nature, a new disposition in his heart towards God. Remember that um, before the fall, he would wait for the evening hours when God would come down, that he might walk with him in the garden, as it were, in the, in the cool of the evening. But after the fall, we see him doing something entirely different. We see him afraid. We see him hiding from God because of his exposure, because of his guilt, because of his corruption. We see instead of him accepting responsibility for the choice that he made, yes, God, I have sinned against you. I have broken your covenant. I have eaten of the tree. Instead, we see him shifting the blame to his wife. And we see him shifting the blame to God. Genesis 3, verses 9 through 12. 
Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. The woman, God, the woman you gave me, she gave me of this fruit, and I ate. Now again, does this, what we see in Adam here, does this look familiar at all? Does this sound at all familiar? I mean, it's what we go through every day, right? But we heard Jesus say this morning in John 3, verses 19 through 20, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. After Adam sinned, he would not come to God. He wouldn't come to the light. He felt naked. He felt exposed. He didn't want the shame of his sin exposed. The whole human race since the fall does exactly the same thing, which is why apart from God's grace, we would all perish because none of us would want to come to God. We love evil. We hate the light. We don't want to come to the light. We don't want our sins exposed. What we see Adam doing in the garden is basically what has happened to the entire human race. Now that's why we are in the state that we are in. That's why we are corrupt. That's why, apart from the grace of God, we could not come and no one would come, which is why God must choose out some to show mercy on and grant his spirit. Now, men don't want to come for the same reason that Adam didn't want to come when he was hiding in the garden from God. Paul writes in Romans 3, verses 10 through 12, and this is a commentary on the entire human race. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. This is the result of the fall. This is the result of the, of the guilt, but mainly of the corruption. Are there any exceptions to this? Paul says, no, there are none. No exceptions. Everyone has turned away from God. No one does good. No one even seeks him. Not even one. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 8, he gives us a little bit more insight into what's going on in the hearts of these who have fallen away from God in Adam. And again, our situation prior to God's mercy. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Apart from God's grace, apart from His Spirit, there is nothing we can do to please God. There is nothing we can do to submit to His law. Now, we might be able to obey it outwardly. We might be able to go through the motions, but we can never do it from the heart because we love Him. That is why Jesus says we need the Spirit of God before we'll ever be able to trust Jesus, which is why He said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Jesus says in John chapter 6, verses 63 through 65, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. It's not a permissive thing. He's not saying no one has my permission. It's actually a command. Everyone is commanded to come. But he says no one can come. No one has the ability to come because the flesh profits nothing. We are guilty and we are corrupt and we hate God and we will not submit to his law and we will not please him. We cannot please God. It is the Spirit who gives life. Jesus says you must be born again. So we asked the question this morning, why is it that if you don't believe in Jesus that you've been judged already? Why are you condemned already? It's because of Adam. 
It's because of what you are in Adam, because you were guilty in Adam, because you were corrupt in Adam, because like David, you were conceived and born in sin, because you hate God and will not submit to him, because you love evil. That's what Adam did to you. By the way, he did that to everyone. He did it to every single one of us here this morning or this evening. We are all affected by the fall. There are no exceptions. That is what Adam, as your representative, did to you. Okay, now that's the bad news, but don't forget, there is good news. Adam was a type of the one who was coming. God provided a second Adam, one who was pictured by the first, one who, unlike the first Adam, actually obeyed God, and one who, unlike the first Adam, had to also make a payment to pay for the sins that we had committed, even that sin of Adam that was imputed to us, one who died on the cross. Uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15.45, so also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Adam may have given to us physical life, but it's the second Adam who gives to us spiritual life because Adam, who being our father, as it were, is the source of our physical life, also killed us. He took away that life by his decision. And again, we do have to be careful how much we blame Adam. He is responsible. But we would have done the same thing. That's, that was God's plan. But let's be thankful that God gave the second Adam, the last Adam, who became a life-giving spirit. Again, as we read in John 3, verses 16 through 18, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world or to condemn it but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged or is not condemned. So God allowed the fall that he might send his son to reveal his mercy and his grace so that all who trust in him would not perish in their justly deserved condemnation but would be forgiven and have eternal life. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die so also in Christ all will be made alive. That, that is, at least all in Christ will be made alive. As we saw before in John chapter 3, Jesus is the reason why the new birth exists, why the Spirit can work to open blind eyes to see the kingdom of God in the Lord Jesus Christ, why the Spirit of God can change stony hearts so that His people will want to trust in Jesus and receive Him that's why the children of light exist, who practice the truth and come to the light, as Jesus said this morning, by trusting in him and turning from their sins. So again, I would ask you the question that I asked you this morning, are you one of these children? Do you love Jesus Christ? Have you come to him? Have you trusted him? Do you love the light, not only the light as it is in Jesus, but do you love the light of his word? Are you reading the word? Are you applying the word? Are you living according to the word? Are you putting off all your sins and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you serving him faithfully out of love? If that's true of you, then you are no longer in Adam but you are in Christ. You're no longer dead, but you are alive. You're no longer condemned, but you're forgiven. You're no longer on your way to hell, but you're on your way to heaven, if these things are true of you. But if they're not true of you, then you're still an Adam. And if you're still an Adam, I would encourage you again to come to Jesus. Again, remember, Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only truth. Jesus is the only one in whom there is life. If you want to see heaven and not suffer in hell forever, you must turn from your sins, you must trust Jesus to save you, and you must follow him 
in absolutely everything that he tells you to do in his word. doesn't mean he's going to condemn you if you do not do that, but it, what it means is if you have trusted Jesus, if you have the Spirit of God in you, if you've been born again, that's what you're going to want to do. And so that is what you will, in fact, do. So trust in Jesus. And again, I would encourage you, if you don't want to, if you don't want to come to him, if you've heard this many times before and you say, you know what, I've heard that. I, I know what I need to do, but I'm just not going to do it right now. I'm just going to put that off. You need to realize that that desire to choose Jesus doesn't come from you. Because remember what we saw about our condition in Adam, guilty and corrupt, cannot please God, cannot submit to his law, cannot come to the light because our sins will be exposed. You can't change that heart of yours. That's outside of your power. You need God's spirit to do that. So if you don't want to come, then you need to pray for his mercy and ask God to send his spirit to change your heart because if you don't repent and if you don't believe and if you don't follow Jesus, you will perish. You will end up in hell. But if you will repent and believe and follow him by his grace, you will live. May God give you the grace then to trust in the Lord Jesus. This isn't a game. This is true. If you don't believe it now, one day you will find out that it is the truth. So make sure that you take what Jesus says seriously because this is what's real. Everything else is basically an illusion. It's sin, it's evil, it's going to perish. It's a lie. This is the truth. We need to listen to it. Let's bow for a moment of prayer and ask the Lord to apply this, his word to uh, our hearts this evening.